welcome uh, to to Revolutions of Fitness here, and uh, we'll be getting rolling here momentarily with uh, the the first thing. I think the the we're going to start out with uh, Ryan, um, who has a very informative discussion about how you can use some advanced uh, understanding of exercise physiology to come up with a remarkably simple approach to training. Um, so I think Ryan is here in the background somewhere. If he can unmute himself and come forward. Hey, I'm here. There's how Ryan. Okay, sweet. I'm going to jump into the background here and we'll let Ryan go. All right. Hi guys, how's it going? Uh, my name is Ryan Moore. Um, I am a coach with Achieve PTC, a coaching company based out of uh, out of the Bay Area. Here, I've been coaching with them for seven or eight years. Uh, I'm also a bike fitter with Revolutions in Fitness. I've been bike fitting for 11, 12 years. Been with Revolutions in Fitness for um, the better part of a year at this point. Um, so yeah, I just want to do a, a, a sort of brief um, discussion and overview on. Um, you know, with, with training, um, I think it's important to ask yourself, okay, I'm investing this much time, um, every week in on the bike and I'm, I'm trying to get ideally you're trying to get faster, whether you're a racer or, um, whether you're just trying to continue to, to, to develop and, 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 and reach new goals and new heights of your fitness, get that, get that next PR. Um, and I think it's always important to ask yourself is what I'm doing working, um, and if it is, how effective is it working? Um, and you know, more often than not, you can find like maybe in the last season or two, you've, uh, you've hit a little bit of a plateau. Um, and so I want to basically, I don't want to get super into the technical minutia because I don't think that's going to be of uh, good value for everyone. I want to kind of take like, like Justin said, um, uh, take some of the advanced things I know about, uh, physiology and, 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 just how people uh, metabolize and, and how um, they're pulling from different energy systems to, to generate power um, and, and give you some, some key and succinct insights on, on how to maybe, you know, move the needle with your training and, uh, and get the most out of the bike here. Um, so um, we can get started here. Again, if you're just coming in, make sure you turn your camera off and mute that um, just because we have a lot of people here today. Um, so uh, the first thing, like, I'm sure there's plenty of people here that have maybe sensed a little bit of a plateau. Um, I know with COVID, a lot of people aren't having to commute into work. So maybe they have a little bit more time to ride and um, maybe they're riding more and they kind of got a little bit of a bump of fitness in the first few months. And now it's a year later and it's, uh, you know, maybe I'm, you're kind of treading water a little bit. Um, one thing that weekend warriors, recreational cyclists up to elite racers, um, uh, commonly do, um, which is a bit of a, a fatal mistake, is um, they ride too hard too often, right? Uh, especially you get out before work, you want to get a sweat on and, um, you know, get the heart rate up and, and feel like you accomplished something. And, and that's great. Um, but riding, you know, above zone two, zone three, more than I would even say twice a week, it's going to have um, continually diminishing returns there. Um, so I wanted to just basically give an example of uh, what a, a basic training week should look like um, kind of in the spring, summer, when you know, either um, you finished your preparatory phase or, or you just kind of have a, a similar routine week in, week out. Um, let's say you're riding five days a week. The best way to um, format that week is to have um, let's just use an example. We're going to have Monday as a rest day, right? Cause you probably rode Saturday and Sunday. Um, so you want that data to recover, um, maybe sleep in a little bit. Um, and then on that Tuesday, uh, you're going to want to have a, a primer ride. And what a primer ride is, is it's enough to kind of get the juices going. Um, maybe there's some small efforts here and there, but you're not digging a hole. You're not building anything. You're really, um, finishing the ride, still feeling fresh. Um, and let me know when Ryan's back in, we'll probably jump over to him and let him finish. Um, wow. That was exciting. Uh, it, uh, so who in the heck am I? Oh, come on. Uh, there we go. Uh, I've been a PT for, Oh Jesus this is an old slide 25 or so years. Um, now, 
and um, worked with a, a lot of elite level athletes. But uh, my real passion is is working with everybody out there that just wants to put a smile on their face by riding a bike, um, whether that's as working as a bike fitter or working as a, a physical therapist, um, just getting people out on the bike, feeling good and efficient. Because at the end of the day, we all have these twisted up systems. And you'll recognize this athlete a little bit later. Uh, but I ask you this question, why might an elite athlete like this sit on the bike twisted when they've had so much care um, and they didn't even know that they were twisted. He thought he was setting equally right to left and straight um, straight up. And he said to me, you know, I can use my left leg when the stars are aligned in quotes. So most of us want one of three things. It'd be a little bit more comfortable as we do a triathlon or just uh, ride our bike uh, to be a little bit faster. Uh, in this case, Steve down to San Francisco to LA. Um, or if you anybody recognize him, um, be a little bit faster, win a, a tour maybe, uh, especially when you've got a herniated disc. If you know who he is, maybe you can put it in the, um, put it in the comments section. I'll tell you a little later. So the question is really, is this a body limiter? Is this something that's a dragging break? Maybe you have some mobility issues. Maybe you have some core stability issues. Um, or maybe it's just your brain never learned how to push down on that pedal efficiently um, because you're activating your quads before your hip because of an old injury. So this might just be a, um, a form issue. I think Ryan is back in. Is that right, Justin? Yeah. Okay. So this might just be a form issue. It might be a mobility issue. It might be a core stability issue at a deep level. And you can see here, there's multiple layers to the form, uh, to the, the core, or it might be a, a body habit issue, a form issue. Um, and in this case, she did not know how to push down on that pedal on the right side without her pelvis rocking. She had all kinds of stability. She just had an old movement pattern that got her in a whole lot of trouble. And sometimes it's a bike limiter. Um, you know, the seat's too high or it's too low or the fore aft. And we have to be able to figure out, is this a bike issue um, or is this a body issue? As we just mentioned, sweet, Ryan's back in. Um, so uh, with that, um, I, I think it, it makes sense to, to let Ryan continue here, but I've put out the, the big picture where I'm going. Is it a bike or a body issue? Um, and our, our next job is to really start to understand the connectedness of the system. So I'm going to jump and. Oh. <clears throat> All right, guys, how's it going? Um, so uh, I actually pulled up. Um, an example of, of what I was talking about when we left off, um, talking about how to format a week, right? So if you have five rides, you want two primer rides that are um, sort of leading into your two, you know, the most challenging rides, the, the key workouts um, of, of your week. Um, you want one long endurance day generally, and then, and then some active recovery or, or just unstructured riding. Um, so let me take a look here. I think Curtis is still sharing his screen for us right now. So I'll wait for him to take that down and then I'll share mine. Awesome. Okay. So let's get into this. <clears throat> so, um, here's just a, a an example, a, a pretty decent template here. Um, so like, as I was saying, we have that Monday off. Um, and this is, a, this is around 13 or 14 hours a week. So you can scale this down. A lot of the athletes I work with are, are working professionals. Um, Sorry, it went, it went away, Ryan. Let's try that again. Okay. Um, Sorry. So a lot of the athletes I work with are, are working professionals. And so maybe they're only training eight to 12 hours a week. So you would, you would scale this down. So maybe that two and a half hour uh, base or aerobic endurance ride um, zone two ride is only a 90 minute ride. So we see we have our, our off day. Um, we have some base work. Um, we then have a pretty challenging interval ride uh, that we're going to be nice and open and primed for because of the riding the day before. Um, we have a recovery day, another primer ride. Again, that two and a half hours with a handful of sprints can be pared down to 60 to 90 minutes. 
Um, and then this is an example of more like in season. So you can, you can kind of connect this. Um, I took this off of an athlete that I work with um, who has some family commitments on Sunday. So we don't want to load up the whole weekend when he's working also. So that Saturday ride, it has some intervals in there and then like a, a fair amount of base work after, and then some active recovery the next day. So really want to be thinking about your weeks like this. Um, you know, when, when I was racing, uh, I was probably riding too many hard days a week. Also, if, you know, you're riding with friends, all that stuff. Um, it's really easy to kind of get caught into that. Um, the other thing is a, a reason um, doing easy rides and endurance rides um, are so hard is because if you're doing them properly, um, it should kind of feel too easy for the first one, maybe two hours. And again, like, you know, we're all type A, we want to have a good workout. We want to feel like we're, we're pushing ourselves and, you know, 90 minutes of zone two should be very easy. So if you're doing an aerobic endurance ride and let's say you ne don't necessarily um, use a power meter and, and you aren't super familiar with your, your heart rate zones, um, you know, it should always be the, the duration of the ride um, that makes you tired after three or four hours, not necessarily um, the intensity of it. Um, so just wanted to talk a bit about that. Um, I've made kind of a quantum shift and, and really not giving my athletes more than two, maybe three hard workouts uh, a week in the past few years. Um, and I've had amazing success. That athlete that um, I was talking about that I kind of just dragged over a, a, a a week into, into my own training peaks, just to give you an example, um, this past year, um, using very similar format for all of his weeks, his FTP, um, went up 40 Watts and it was already around 300. So it's, and this is someone I've been coaching for three or four years. So, um, pretty, pretty dramatic results there. Um, so think about that. Are you riding easily enough? Um, often enough, are you riding hard too often? right? Because doing more than two, maybe three hard rides a week, it's going to lower that ceiling. Um, so it is, again, counterintuitive, but riding slow, <laughs> riding slow and steady will make you much faster. Um, so give it a try for a month or so. Um, one of the tools that we have um, to really set um, relevant and accurate um, and impactful um, power prescriptions for our workouts, power zones, being able to track fitness gains and performance development is we have um, a testing software um, that we that we're able to use from a company out of Germany called Inside. Um, that's I-N-S-C-Y-D. Um, and basically, it's, it's very similar to doing something like an FTP field test outdoors um, on your favorite climb or what have you. Um, and not only does it give us, you know, threshold or anaerobic threshold, um, it gives us VO2 max, it gives us lactic threshold, it gives us VLA max. And so because we can see where that rider, um, it, what energy systems that rider is pulling from to execute uh, a certain amount of power, um, even let's say we have two riders, they're both 160 pounds, they both have a threshold of 300 watts, um, they could be developing that power in completely different ways. And so being able to really fine tune that um, uh, to, to, to make the most of it, right? If, if you're more of a sprinter, right? A lower VO2 max, a higher VLA max, um, you're not gonna get faster by just doing a, a boatload of intervals. Like the intervals that I shared uh, on the screen with you, like those are not gonna do anything because they're just gonna make you exhausted uh, and make you kind of hate me. Um, so there's, there's going to be a little bit different approach. So, um, fewer intervals, more like tempo work and ends up being less polarized where you're either riding slow, um, and then really hard, you end up doing a lot of middle intensity stuff. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, just how, how different that, that metabolic fingerprint can be rider to rider, um, and how much more impactful, um, the training, um, I'm prescribing for that rider can be when, when I understand exactly how they're generating this power. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously we got interrupted there. Um, sorry, uh, for everyone that had to see that, like there is no place for any sort of hate speech like that. And I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, but, uh, I really appreciate you joining back on with us. Um, shoot me an email. Um, I'm sure we'll have some, um, some links to share to everyone and, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions, um, and, uh, and, and be a resource. But, uh, but in, in closing, like really check yourself. Are, are you writing, uh, easily enough, often enough? Um, and if you can really be disciplined, um, and just keep those hard, intense rides to once or twice a week, it's counterintuitive. It's hard to, it's hard to believe, but, um, you can have a, have a big impact on, on moving that needle of fitness, uh, with your cycling. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for joining guys. I appreciate it.
All right. Thank you, Ryan. Um, thank you, Curtis, for stepping in there. And sorry, everybody, again, about that. I did not have the uh, auto block feature enabled there uh, for hostile Zoom takeovers. Um, but uh, it is in place now. And uh, we will be able to uh, take a look at the next thing here. And that's going to be what I am dealing with. Let me share my screen. Where did it go? There it is. Uh, I don't want to select multiple windows. Boom. Um, okay. And, you know, so as Curtis mentioned, uh, you know, this is obviously revolutions in fitness. We do bike fit. We do physical therapy. Um, I am a bike fit guy. I've uh, been a, a bicycle guy my whole life. Um, I, I come to uh, rollers and fitness from, from working in, in the city for a city cycle and then for Trek, uh, doing bike sales and bike fitting and sort of a late life, later in life transition. I'd been a lawyer and chef and a bunch of other stuff in, in my earlier life, but always had been a bike racer. And uh, so here I am doing all this fun stuff. Um, and so today we're going to talk about a couple different things. Just a brief overview of what we call evidence-informed fitting, uh, how we use technology to help improve your fit, and then some examples, excuse me, of uh, foot pressure and how we use that to, to measure fit outcomes and uh, for helping improve performance as well. It's, it's, a, it's a metric that, that lets us not just look at force the way a power meter would look at force, but how you're applying the force, so the quality of the application and how it fits into your overall, uh, <clears throat> your particular body, how things are working, the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle. So, oops, I did not want to do that. Let me, uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. Um, so then they, uh, Let's go to the next slide here. So intelligent fit, thinking right, evidence-informed fitting. Uh, we're trying to make wise decisions to get you down the road towards your goals. And then the, the most important thing is, is being able to, to find the thing to change and then knowing how much to change it. Um, there's a lot of information. It's really easy to get distracted with all the tools, all the processes, all the numbers everything that gets dumped in there and pretty much it can lead you astray. Um, and all of a sudden you're tracing squirrels instead of paying attention to the things that matter. Um, so we like to collect some data, identify what data is relevant uh, to the, the cyclist's problem of saddle pain uh, in this ex example, uh, develop a hypothesis about why it's happening and then come up with some interventions on and off the bike in Curtis's realm, the, the kind of things that he would be working on to, to, to help things and then, then decide what needs to be done, recheck everything once you've made a change, see how things fit together and whether or not anything else needs to be changed. And then what's the data that leads us towards that change? Um, how can we get there and how can we improve things? So what do they want? What are the limiting problems? Why are those problems limiting things? Is there any way I can prove that I am wrong or right? Um, let's change something. Let's do something about it and then see if I was wrong or right and then iterate. That's the, uh, the goal. So today we're going to look at some examples of how uh, pressure mapping in the foot uh, can help improve the outcomes and for comfort and performance. Um, and so you're trying to get as much force as you can to the pedals as efficiently as possible. Um, and the, uh, the key, the key element there is how do we measure that? Um, yeah, a power meter can measure force, uh, but what it doesn't tell you how that force is getting put through the pedal and how it's getting applied in the shoe. Uh, the, the company GBMI is a German company makes pressure mapping technology. It's essentially just a web of pressure measuring sensors uh, that are all linked together that create a heat map of pressure inside the shoe, uh, on the pedal, 
uh, or on the saddle. Um, this particular example here is actually of a standing scenario, but the idea is that it creates a heat map of that pressure um, and shows you where it's distributed and how long it's distributed, um, when it's distributed. It gives you this incredible depth of information about that really critical moment, that last little bit uh, as you get down to the pedal. Um, and so we can see here is an example of a rider set up with the pressure mapping technology. We've got the <clears throat> right around the ankles. Uh, you can see the sensors there Velcroed on. We've got some wires leading to a transmitter in its pocket there. And up on the screen is the actual data coming from those sensors. Um, and so Ryan, his goal is to improve your metabolic fitness so that you, you have the capacity to generate more force and get more force. Um, and what we're trying to do is look at how you get that force uh, down there. So um, it, 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 it's obviously really relevant for comfort. If you have a, an uncomfortable spot in your foot, this is incredibly helpful for finding that. But it's also really helpful for the, that, that, that performance-oriented fit client that's really trying to make those marginal gains in improving performance. It's not just a little bit, uh, it's, it's, it's a really precise way to, to get a sense of how everything's coming together in the end and whether or not small changes are having a significant impact. And so we can start off here with a, an example. Um, this rider, this pressure map that's up on the screen right now was the initial pressure map. Um, the rider had just had hip surgery. It was trying to optimize its position. Uh, there may have been a leg length difference. He had a little bit of a twist in his pelvis. And then what we found when we, we got him up on the bike was that the left side, even though he's getting significant force onto the shoe itself, it's this static load and he's not actually generating a lot of force in a useful way uh, uh, um, on the pedal. So you can see the, 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 the bottom little trace there uh, underneath the shoes where there's a, a red and a green line. The red line is the right side, uh, the green line is the left side. And you can see he's getting a lot more force into the pedal on the left than he is on the right. Uh, I think I got that backwards. The left side is the red one. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but the, the, the key being that if you, the, the graph really clearly shows that the, the force is going along in one sort of almost flat line compared to the, the functional side where he's having trouble, he's not having any problem getting actual useful force in the pedal. Um, and so what we did a little bit of coaching um, and some saddle adjustments, moving the saddle forward, um, and just really mostly making him aware of that limitation. All of a sudden, everything looks completely different. Um, and you can really see the results change here. Uh, you've got much more even application across the pedal. And the key thing that we're looking for in this graph here, or I should say in the heat map, excuse me, is that, whoops, did I just go backwards? Yeah, there it is. Um, we're looking for a good distribution of pressure across the forefoot primarily. Um, we're going to set cleat position up so that it is um, roughly by the pedal spindle is roughly bisecting the first and the fifth metatarsal out of the ball, the foot, and then the base of the fifth toe on the outside of the foot. Um, and, and that gives you an, a really efficient place to, to push. Uh, it lets you generate force effectively with the right muscles and it lets you load the pedal effectively uh, throughout the pedal stroke. Uh, for example, if you had the load at the heel, um, it would be very difficult to, to, to pedal effectively. You wouldn't be able to use your ankle to extend uh, your foot through the pedal. Um, and the example that's up on the screen right now is, is a good pressure distribution. Um, you can see that the, the pressure is a little bit higher uh, under the ball of the foot and towards the outside of the foot. Um, the little black squiggle that's in the middle of both of them is the center of pressure, um, very stable, uh, very concentrated, right where it needs to be, right on the pedal. And importantly, if you look at the distribution at the bottom there, 
you've got great looking grass of relatively wide flat topped uh, curves, um, signaling that the, the force is being applied for a relatively long period of time um, and coming off relatively quickly. The only thing you can see that's a little bit different here is that uh, the, uh, the right graph is overlapping with the left graph a little bit, indicating that there's a little bit of a negative feedback there. And that's something that this also helps you look at, get into some of the off the body stuff that there's, there's a break somewhere in his body that is limiting his ability to apply force to the pedals. Let's see if we can get this ahead. There we go. Do, 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 do. All right. And so this is another example here. Um, really, really uncomfortable situation. Um, I, I think that, and then one of the great things about the heat map is it's really intuitive. Uh, you just look at it and you can see something's not right. Um, you've got this just really intense spot of pressure um, on the outside of both feet. And that is exactly what this rider was dealing with. It's, uh, it wasn't sustainable. And it, it also, if you, if you look at an optimal pressure distribution for the foot, you're not seeing it loaded the way it should be. Now, if this person were just looking at power data, maybe it's fine. You know, he's getting forced down to the pedals, but it's not working because it's not comfortable and it's not doing it in the most efficient way. So when, particularly if you're looking at a marginal gains type scenario, let's, let's get the foot efficiently generating force on the pedal as opposed to just mashing on the pedal. And the, the other thing you can see here too also is that the, the left side, the, 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 the red peak is a little bit shorter than it is on the right, um, wasn't optimal. Um, so here's that ideal looking graph again. This is the same writer, that same session after pretty relatively common, simple things. One of the things we identified was way too much arch support, lifting his foot up out, out of the shoe, really. So he's putting a lot of load on the outside of his foot. Um, and just a really simple change. Uh, put in a basic sort of off the shelf foot support and all of a sudden, boom, um, he's got that nice uh, power distribution. Uh, the, the, the force is evenly distributed across the foot, really clean, really stable, sort of the best case scenario. Um, but it's a really strong signal that we're moving in the right direction in terms of making those marginal gains that improve performance. All right, um, another example. Here's a starting pressure map. Um, in a similar type of scenario, we've got discomfort. Um, this is from a pro cyclist. They were having a lot of trouble with foot pain, um, had been trying different shoes, all kinds of different things, uh, was using a custom uh, orthotic because that was, the, you know, your feet hurt, try out a custom orthotic. That's That's gotta be the problem. Um, It's, you know, then you look at the pressure map. Uh, let's go in there. Let's get a little bit more granular. And all of a sudden you see, why is there this huge pressure spot on the heel on both feet? Um, that's, that's not, there shouldn't be pressure there. At least not that magnitude of pressure. And it's just kind of messy and not focused on the forefoot. Um, it was a similar type of scenario. Yeah, that 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 arch support was just way too high, and we got a stock footbed in there, um, along with some other changes on the bike. Um, but the 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 focus really was was being able to make the 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 the, the, the leap from uncomfortable, peaky looking power. So you can see the 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 graph uh, here where the, the, the power peaks are very pointed, uh, meaning that it's quick on and quick off at the most, at the highest point, potentially higher, but also uh, the, the absolute magnitude that they're able to generate in terms of power is lower. In this case, you can see those, those long flattish tops, meaning that force is getting applied to the pedal for a much longer period of time. Again, strong signal that we're moving in the right direction and that you can take that physiology that Ryan is helping you develop 
and apply it more efficiently to the pedal. All right, and this is, this is a, a good one because it gives you a good sense of kind of the subtleties of, of, of how this level of data can help refine things. Um, you know, I was getting some pressure on the fifth metatarsal head. And you can see that on, on the right that, excuse me, that the, uh, the, the pressure was showing up. It's not high, but it's there. There's something happening there. And okay, but th in this case, the nice thing is that it gives you this visual and data-based thing that lets you tie in the, the, the athlete's subjective experience, my, my, my foot hurts on the outside, on the right side, with something that, that shows there's, there's something happening there. Okay, this is great. We can, we can do something about this. What's going on? Well, he'd been struggling with uh, discomfort in the shoes, um, had been fussing around to things and had tried moving the cleat as far back as possible on the shoe. The, 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 the guess based on this information is that, well, maybe if we, because in this case, it ended up putting the fifth metatarsal head, the outside the base of his fifth toe on the outside of his foot, basically on top of the pedal spangle, really far forward. So with that cleat really far towards the heel, putting not enough pressure on the forefoot. So what we tried doing was moving the cleat forward, lining that up a little bit better. And sure enough, you can see that pressure shift forward. There's still pressure on the outside. It's not perfect. But when you flip between the two before and after, so the starting and the final, you can see that pressure shifting forward. Um, and that, that it gives you that visual, okay, we're moving in the right direction. And, and then in this case, there's a lot of challenges going on with the foot. There was a significant angle to the foot that needed support. There was a varus. Um, so there were a lot of other challenges, but what this does is it gives you that, that feedback that, okay, yeah, we are moving in the right direction. We've got data here. And again, you can see that graph where the, all of a sudden that the, the, the data just looks much smoother. Oops, what happened? I went all the way to Curtis. That wasn't the last one. Oh, I guess that was the last one. Okay, um, perfect. Well, then, then that is the transition. Um, <laughs> let me stop sharing my screen here. Um, but we'll uh, we, we have we have some time for Curtis to jump in and kind of fill in that last gap because we've talked about how the you know Ryan talks about some of the basics of training. You absolutely want to make sure that you're getting the right engine development um, and fitting. We're we're bringing in some really precise technology that lets us look at the end of the the kinetic chain and uh, lets uh, lets us you know, help people make sure that they're using that engine or at least uh, connecting that engine in the right way to the bike. Um, and then Curtis is going to give us some thoughts on, on some, uh, some body aspects that could be adding or limiting our capacity to, to, to fully function too. So Curtis. Yeah. And I still don't have share screen yet. So okay. Let me fix that. that. You got it. And Okay. You got me clean? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's just so exciting to see the changes. Let me get my, um, if anyone hasn't tried um, blue light filtering glasses, they're amazing for looking at the screen. It makes such a difference. Anyways, um, thanks so much, Justin. It's just amazing to see and the kind of changes we can objectively uh, quantify with our cyclists to be able to figure out where those things are coming from, uh, to understand, and did the change that we just made, coming back to your original slide, did the change that we just made really make a difference? Is going to make a difference on not just the, you know, not just the century, but the 50 mile ride and not just the 50 mile ride, but the, the performance event that you had. Because so many times these things pop up, not at the beginning of a bike fit, but they 
pop up, you know, late into a ride or late into an event. And these objective metrics we have, these uh, pressure mapping metrics, especially at the feed and at the saddle and the video capture, allow us to objectively measure small changes, millimeter changes. Um, and so many times those things pop up as we're, as we're doing fitting, they pop up as uh, we change the body in a certain way. So... <clears throat> Again, I want to thank everyone for continuing to hang around. Um, let's see, where are we at? Sweet. That gives me about 20 minutes and then uh, 15 minutes and we'll, we'll go into questions. So part one, if we're going to understand what is keeping our cyclists from getting to um, better power and performance, then we, uh, we really need to, come on, are you going to let me go? There we go. And we really need to explore the interconnectedness of the body systems um, because it's a chain where we're locked in at one end in the bike, uh, sometimes quite literally with Graham Obrey's bike. This is just really amazing. See, if you, if you look really closely as this clipped in pedal in quotes, he actually has the axle going through the bottom of the shoe. That man was so inventive. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, or at the other end of the bike where eventually we want the wheel to be pointed straight ahead. So if we have some twist in the middle, then we're going to get in trouble. We're uh, in this closed system, if you will. And when we take a fall, when we take a fall, our whole body hits the ground. It's what I was talking about before, and that our whole system, our ankles, our knees, our shoulders, our neck, and how many of us haven't taken a, a fall off of the bike or as a kid? Uh, these systems end up with these traumas in them. Ooh, that's loud. Sorry about that. Uh, these systems end up with traumas, these stuck points, these tight points. And we end up with a fascial uh, chain. Um, and I call it a chain based upon Thomas Myers's work. As you do these dissections, as I've done, um, and Thomas Myers has done, you start to see these chains of muscles starting not just at an ankle and finishing at a knee as, um, uh, as the calf does, but going up into the next muscle, the hamstring. So so these long chains of muscles that are quite literally interconnected by the webbing around and through muscles that's called fascia. Fascia is nicely visualized as the casing on sausage. So we have these long casings that are interconnected. Um, and so that if your quote hamstring gets tight, many times you'll see that if you loosen up your calf or if you loosen up your back, you end up with more mobility across this, in this case, superficial back line, which is what Thomas Myers calls it. But these lines of fascia, these chains of muscles don't just go up and down the front of the body and the back of the body in a, a straight line, but some of them uh, cross through the system. So these, um, the, these chains many times are called tensegrity systems. Tensegrity is a, uh, a term by Buckminster Fuller. And you all know what a tensegrity system is. It's one link that's not connected to all the other links, but still has an effect on all the other links. And guess what the analogy is here? A great example of this is the bicycle wheel, where if any one link, any one spoke is too tight or too loose, you end up a, with a wheel wheel that's out of true and out of line across the entire system, right to left across the body or front to back, um, whether we're looking at a foot connected to a knee or a hip connected uh, to a back, you hit a hole, you fall in a hole, you fall off your bike, you sit on the, the computer, and now all of a sudden you have a knee that's dropping in when you push down on the pedal, or you just uh, get a very inefficient system, a very inefficient system, a hip that's twisted or a core that can't deliver power, um, whether you're pushing from the top down uh, and it's the pelvis driving the system or the pushing from the bottom up and it's the foot driving the system. So what we end up with is this idea of bullies and victims, criminals and victims. So somebody's knee hurts um, so often is the case and the knee is just stuck between a rock and a hard place where nowhere to go. Um, you end up with the bully, which might be the hip, uh, or you end up with a bully, which might be the thoracic spine, the mid back. And then a victim, you know, pressure on the saddle. You end up with a bully that's the foot and a victim, which is the knee. Um, so you can feel it for yourself. And I'm not going to ask people to do given our, our time frames and our starting of all this. But um, a lot of people already know that when your foot collapses in many times more on one side than the other, as you pronate or as your hip gets a little weak, uh, a knee will drop in. The foot collapses a little bit. The knee collapses a little bit. But few people think about that, what's happening above that knee, because if the knee moves, 
mustn't the hip move or if the hip twists mustn't the knee twist so this system and it all makes sense uh, but if you really think about it if the pelvis twists one way um, don't the handlebars need to be straight don't your hands need to be straight so if your pelvis is twisted a little bit to the left because the knee is twisted a little bit to the left but the shoulders and the hands are straight ahead what's twisted in the middle what is causing that low back pain what is causing your shoulder uh, if your pelvis is twisted because your si joint your low back your uh, is a little bit off then what's happening to the knee um, so uh, dysfunction anywhere in this interconnected system affects the entire system so uh, whether it's a saddle pressure that looks really funky or a foot pressure that looks pretty funky we see all the time when we start to get rid of these dragging brakes when we start to correct these dysfunctions whether they because of the body or the bike that people get a whole lot centered and this example actually happens to be a, a mid-back stiffness that three minutes later after the person had mobilized their thoracic spine hopped on a foam roller, rolled up and down a little bit. Their back felt a lot better. They hopped back on the bike and all of a sudden they went, where is my sit bone pressure at? That saddle, did you change the saddle? Why does my saddle feel so much better? Uh, that's really odd. Uh, and what happened is they mobilized their thoracic spine and they're, they're less twisted in their thoracic spine, their mid back, their upper back, and therefore they're less twisted in the pelvis and voila. Uh, you don't need to change your saddle maybe. And of course, this is uh, um, not so unusual for a lot of people. We all end up with these right hand dominance. We end up with twists, et cetera. Um, so if you really want to get healthy, if you really want to get back and do a comprehensive rehabilitation, which so few of us go through after just sitting for a long time at a computer or a fall or an injury, an ankle sprain, a fall on the hip, if you really want to get back to getting good, efficient power down to the pedal or getting rid of a problem, you have to go through a comprehensive process. And most of us get stuck somewhere along the way. I'm going to do a quick review here of that. Number one, what's the underlying cause? What's really the driver across the system? Number two, where are the knots? Where are the tight stuff? Where is the stiff stuff? Was it that old clavicle fracture that's driving a knee problem? Um, uh, wow, we found it's the clavicle that's driving the knee. We need now to get the mobility, the soft tissue mobility around that clavicle more mobile. Or maybe it's um, your foot isn't strong enough. You don't have a good foot neuromuscular control and your arch keeps collapsing because your feet have been locked up in shoes for you years and you need to improve the intrinsic strength, the neuromuscular control of your foot. Um, maybe it's more about neuromuscular control um, as opposed to mobility. So number one, find the driver. Where is it coming from? Number two, improve the mobility at that driver. Number three, get some control, some coordination, the brain to start to learn good form. Um, number four, okay, now you have good form locally. Your brain knows how to control your core or maybe your foot. Your brain knows how to control part of the orchestra orchestra, if you will, the orchestra of muscles. Uh, now you need to figure out how to make that foot connect to your core and your core connect to your hands, kind of a global motor control. One instrument in the orchestra has to be able to play with the rest of the orchestra efficiently. And then finally, strength and endurance. Great. You, you know, your foot and your core are working well together, but do you have the physiology? Let's talk to Ryan about how to get good strength for climbing the hills on the bike. Let's talk to Ryan about how to get from a 30 mile ride up to an 80 mile ride or from a, you know, a 10 K, um, up to a hundred K. So these are the steps and most people get stuck somewhere along the way. They go to see a, a Cairo to get mobilization of their thoracic spine, but they don't get the coordination locally, or they see a PT or a personal trainer to get good strength and endurance. And they're working on their foot and they should be working on their back problem. So most people get stuck at one of these and they never really get all of them in one place. So uh, number one, be an inspector to find the underlying diagnosis, the underlying problem, because so often uh, we're just cleaning up the mess. We're putting band-aids on and we, um, we really need to be the plumber as opposed to just the person mopping up the system. So finding the criminal, if we're going to really make wise clinical decisions. Um, number two, 
mobility. What's stiff? Because most of us are sitting over a computer and we go, yeah, it makes sense that that would make us stiff. But then we sit over a bike and go, why am I 80 years old or 60 years old? Or I see teenagers now, I'm 16 years old and I can't stand up straight. I can't get my chest open. I can't get my shoulders back. Well, why not? Why can't you get in a good posture? Use your diaphragm, use your core. Why can't you be in a good place? Because the body is cement waiting to harden. The body is cement waiting to harden. And whatever position we stick ourselves in the most is the position we're going to get stuck there. So if the body is cement waiting to harden, the flip side of that, and so many of us are stuck here in this pandemic stiffness of setting at the computer, if the body is cement waiting to harden, the flip side of that coin is motion is lotion. Um, and here's a really great example. Another person I hope you all know, <laughs> who's an amazing freaking athlete. If you, if you watch, um, if you watch his mobility here, he not only has an ability to control the bike. And my favorite part is right here at the very end where this guy behind him says, Hey, wow, check this guy out. What is he doing? Uh, as Peter does some amazing things on and off the bike. So we need to go through your musculoskeletal system, the whole system, and just do a quick screen of it. It's not just about, is your hip stiff? Is it your shoulder stiff? And we use a lot of this selective functional movement assessment uh, developed by Greg Cook to do a quick musculoskeletal screen as well as dive in to the intricacies the, uh, of your hip mobility because the hips drive so much down to the knee and up to the low back. And we need to make sure that your system is moving well and then really hone in on those places that are, are really quite stiff. Um, whether looking at you in a cycling like position, in this case, looking at uh, her hips, Sarah's hips and her low back, um, and making sure that the low back has good arching abilities and the hip could has good bending abilities. Or uh, here I can also evaluate whether the thoracic spine, this mid back, upper back, has good arching and rounding. Uh, because at the end of the day, if the trunk can't arch, if the thoracic spine can't extend and the chest can't open, um, then that's going to affect your bike fit. If you don't have good mobility, then your bike fit needs to look very different than if you have good mobility in your hip, your thoracic spine, your hamstring. So we need to do a cycling specific evaluation. That's the key here uh, to make sure that, um, that your bike fit fits you and we're not just putting you some crazy aggressive position uh, that doesn't work. And then untying some of those stiffnesses. So at the end of the day, we make sure that we, we make the bike fit fit you uh, and and then as you get healthier, we can, we can take some of those band-aids off of that bike fit. We can take out some of those accommodations and get you back in a, in a place that might be more aerodynamic um, where we don't have to accommodate as much. So this is a nice, uh, simple exercise, and we've got a bunch of exercises sitting on our YouTube channel, uh, very specific uh, to cycling. You can check those out, whether it be some cycling-specific exercises for hip mobility, and this is one of them I pulled off um, YouTube, or thoracic mobility uh, that really helps open up the hips uh, in a way that allows you to be a little more aerodynamic. Just wiggling the feet side to side while your low back is in neutral really helps mobilize the hips and the low back. But the key key here is, is I want to just bring you back to you need mobility in the system, in particularly of this hip joint, in particularly of your lumbar spine and a little bit of your thoracic. Um, this also does a nice job of retraining the brain because, as I mentioned, if the orchestra um, of the muscular system is not playing very well and you don't have good form of movement, you can get in trouble. Um, there's some really nice mobilizations up there and I'm, um, I'm not showing them to you because it's easy to pull them up on our YouTube channel, uh, mobilizations of the, the deep hip and butt muscles, the piriformis, as well as the hip joint with some contract relax. So if mobility is number one, um, we need to, to loosen up some of those stiff, tight areas, untie some of the knots in the rubber band. And I'll actually say that again, we need to untie some of the knots in the rubber band. So if you just stretch on that rubber band, if you think about a rubber band with a knot on it and you do a simple stretch without untying the knot, you never get much more mobility in the rubber band. You just end up loosening up all the stuff around it. So it becomes important for you not just to do these passive or even dynamic stretches, but it becomes important for you to put your fingers on or us to put our fingers on some of those knots, get a, on a foam roller and find that specific tightness um, to be able to untie um, some of those specific dysfunctions where they've been glued down. 
So if number one is um, figure out where it's coming from. Number two is get some mobility in that area. Um, number three is improve your stability, your coordination, your control on and off the bike, stability and control on and off the bike. We do some very specific um, stability testing on the bike to make sure that your core is not only engaged in a plank way, uh, but can you lift up one hand or lift up the other hand or even maybe suspend yourself depending upon your level of you know power on the bike? Can you, can you get your core to suspend you on the bike uh, as opposed to the weight on your hands to suspend you on the bike? So there's some core stability testing we like to use uh, on the bike uh, to make sure it's kicking in there. And of course, we um, do a lot of stability testing off the bike. But so many of us, um, we're doing all of these uh, core stability exercises and we're having a hard time getting our core to engage. Um, and that's because they, we haven't stepped back into the, the last piece, which is we don't have efficient alignment. Um, maybe our lumbar spine has a little bit of rotation to it. Maybe our hip is a little bit stiff and dysfunctional. We don't have good alignment. And it's really hard to create power through a joint when that joint just is isn't efficiently uh, in a good place. The ball isn't seated in the socket for the hip or for the shoulder or the lumbar spine has a shift, a twist. Um, and then once we have efficient alignment, then we have to have a core first strategy. We need to make sure that the core kicks in before everything else. Because the the brain is really, I keep talking about this idea of um, this idea of a, an instrument. You've got a muscular instrument, like in an orchestra, and the um, the the brain is the conductor of that muscular instrument. And our brains are programmable, and we're the programmers. So if we if we walk with a rock in our shoe, we've had an old ankle injury. If we walk with a little bit of a gimp because we uh, we just fractured our hip six months later, a year later. Later, you watch those movement patterns and even those, those dysfunctions of fully healed, our brains are programmable and we're the programmers. We've learned how to move with a limp. Uh, we've learned how to move with a limp. And so the next thing you know, we're still walking like we have a rock in our shoe, uh, even though our, um, the rock has been long gone for a while. So we need to start to retrain. It's been said by Bob Donatelli, a very well-known physical therapist out there, that uh, we must activate the right muscles. We got to tell the brain has to tell that flute to play, um, and so many times it forgets to tell those transverse abdominal muscles, tell that deep core to work. The brain must activate the right muscles, the core, at the right time, in the right amount, in the correct sequence. So, in order for things to work appropriately. So, let's dive into that a little bit. Because the, the research uh, just really nicely says that the um, core fatigue, if those core muscles, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by core in a minute, if those core muscles aren't working well, there's an increased risk of injury at the knee joint. The knee, is poten knee joint is potentially exposed to greater stress. Improved core stability and endurance could promote greater alignment of the lower extremity. Uh, so yes, indeed, um, uh, there is a relationship between core or, and in this case, knee stability uh, and knee biomechanics. So um, if you're seeing your knees drop in, if you're seeing your pelvis um, move a little bit around, if you're feeling like you've got a lot of weight on your hands, it might just be um, driven from the core. It might just be driven from the core of the hip or the core of the foot or the core of the trunk. So there we go. This is what I was looking for. So Eric walked in and said, um, I really thought this was a little later. Um, Eric walked in and said, you know, my knee keeps falling in when I'm riding. I think that that's what's causing my pain. And you'll see him a little bit later. Um, and he's like, why does my knee keep hurting? Uh, and you'll watch him go into a backward lunge here in a minute. And you'll see all of a sudden, wow, his, his knee uh, stays a fair bit straighter. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Um, yeah, you probably already know where I'm going with this, given what I just talked about. So um, the core, whoa, whoa, there we go. Um, the core, 
if you're going to fire your quadriceps muscles, if you're going to fire your hamstring muscles, if you're going to put a lot of power down in the pedal, it's a whole lot uh, better to fire those cannons, if you will, uh, from a battleship than it is to fire those big muscles from a canoe. And essentially, that's what happened uh, with Eric. And it, it, it'll surprise you in a minute what canoe he was standing on, hint, hint. Um, but as we saw in the last um, the last slide that that, that canoe could be stability in the pelvis or the, the trunk, uh, or that canoe could be something that he's standing on and it's tipped. The core, the core of the trunk is so often thought about as the six pack of muscles, the rectus abdominis. Sometimes it's thought about as these external abdominal obliques. Uh, but what I propose to you is these extrinsic muscles, uh, the muscles that we can see, um, the glutes, the quads, the rectus abdominis, the deltoids, all of these extrinsic muscles, they're not the battleship. Um, and uh, a lot of research is now pointing to this. You see people with dysfunction and pain. You see people with inefficiencies. And actually what you see is the extrinsic muscles are kicking in pretty nicely. Um, these big superficial muscles are not the core in a way. They are actually the cannons. What's underneath the cannons, what's underneath the rectus abdominis, which is meant to do crunches for you, is a deeper set of muscles. Um, uh, your internal abdominal oblique, your transverse abdominis, as you see in this most inner layer. Um, those muscles are meant to, if you can envision in your mind for me for a moment, a balloon. Those transverse abdominal muscles, the deep below back muscles, as you can see here, the um, not so much the QL, but the um, uh, the the multifidi, uh, which are collectively called the erector spinate here, sort of. Um, those deep muscles are much more responsible for, for squeezing the balloon. And when you squeeze the balloon, you actually end up with a longer balloon. You end up with your trunk getting longer so that you have core stability as opposed to if you just kick in your rectus abdominis, if you just turn on your quads or your hamstrings without the deep hip, hip muscles. Um, if you just turn on your rectus abdominis, you end up in a crunch. If you turn on your transverse abdominis first, a core first strategy, then all of a sudden you end up with muscles working better. And here's what I keep alluding to is these muscles aren't just in the, the core, these uh, around the trunk. These muscles are the core muscles of your shoulders. Uh, these muscles are the core muscles of your hip, the deep hip rotators. Um, the famous one here is the piriformis. The less famous is the... Um, the uh, the quadratus femur ah, yeah I just lost it <laughs> quadratus femoris uh, or the um, the other deep hip and uh, butt rotators. So again, back to, um, and I'm not going to play it, but back to some, a nice stability exercise for the trunk. The question here is, can you hinge from your hip or do you just flex your back as you hinge down into the bike? Um, are you able to keep your core stable in such a way that your deep hip rotators are working, your transverse abdominals are working, and you really get, um, you really get a nice uh, flexion or bend from the hip as opposed to the back? Where am I at? I'm getting pretty close. Um, awesome. So we can do our traditional stability exercises, which are great, but really think about how we kick in the deeper muscles at the, the same time. Maybe there's some simple bird dogs that we can do. Um, maybe there's some hands and knees work that you saw earlier, but kicking in that, that deep trunk can be quite important. For instance, a really simple exercise like a row, if you're doing it well, is promoting stability through the entire chain. Her foot muscles are connecting here to provide a good arch. Uh, her lumbar spine isn't rotating if she's doing it well, even though this band is trying to pull her into rotation. And you can see just the beautiful alignment, uh, the, the lack of rounding in her upper back, the lumbar spine, the low back is nice and neutral. Um, or you can get really deep and uh, go in an isolated way, way to do some clamshells, sideline, opening up a knee uh, with your hips bent, uh, backward lunges, obviously a much more challenging exercise, much more global relative to a sideline knee lift, the clamshell. Or a lot of you have seen those nasty monster walks, the crab, crab walk kind of exercises. But getting off the bike and doing these interventions that really aim at the, the deep core stability as opposed to so the superficial core strength is what I'm getting at here. Um, 
This is another really nice, uh, you'll notice the bands underneath the knee, another really nice deep hip and trunk core stability exercise, making sure that she's just keeping that lumbar spine nice and neutral while she's waking up her gluteus minimus, her gluteus medius, and some of our other deep hip rotators. Um, a really nice exercise that really burns people's glute med nicely uh, and working on strength uh, as well as neuromuscular and some brain control. And then where I'm going to finish up here is just to say, don't forget about your foot. Um, all of these intrinsic stabilizers in your foot, because if your arch isn't being supported by the deep muscles of the, the ankle, the calf, and the foot, if your intrinsic stabilizers of your foot aren't working, then everything else starts to collapse. This is Eric again, and this is Eric on his right foot, just relaxing his foot. This isn't him pushing his foot in on the right side. This is him just relaxing into his neutral position. He had all kinds of mobility. His brain just did not know how to stand in an efficient position. So waking up some of his deep foot muscles, waking up some of his deep calf muscles, uh, doing some hands-on work with him and doing some homework with him made a huge difference in his ability to produce power down into the pedal. And so what you looked at when we looked at the pressure map uh, was this, are you going to fly for me? What I looked at when we looked at the pressure map was um, on his left side, he was able to get stability through the ball of his foot. We were able to get control through the bottom of his foot. And on his right side, he could only put pressure on the outside of his foot. And then a leaning tower of Pisa happened. And the next thing you know, his right knee collapsed in, as you saw earlier. So what I'm getting at is whether we're talking about the core stability in the foot driving the knee or the core stability in the hip driving the knee or the core stability in the, in the hip driving the back, it's all looking at figuring out where your brain doesn't have good control and waking it up so it works well. And don't forget, if you don't have good mobility, you don't have a good option for stability at the end of the day. So why might a rider set all bent and twisted because his brain, though he'd had a lot of therapy, though his brain didn't know uh, where neutral was, he didn't know he was sitting on the bike and we needed to reload the software, get the conductor of the brain talking to his core a lot better uh, and so that he could stand on top of that podium some years ago. So with that, that's me. How did I do? Pretty well for time. And I'm going to stop my share and push it back over to Justin and see what uh, questions pop up. Perfect. Thanks, Curtis. Um, let me just stop that. Perfect. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. I think we got almost everybody back in after our bizarre foray into the netherworld of the Internet. Uh, but it's good to be back in the light of day. Um, never had experienced that before. Uh, but I'm really glad everybody was, was able to connect here. I just, uh, Debbie, I just saw you drop a, t a text in there. I'm just responding. Um, and, and actually, Curtis, if, if, if you could look in the, in the text real quick, she, uh, Debbie had a question about knee replacement there. I wanted to get, awesome. get a more specific answer to her. Um, but if people do have questions, um, I know we budgeted just until about now, uh, time-wise, but if, if people do have questions, go ahead and drop them into the, into the text, uh, what do they call it? Chat box. And, uh, we, awesome. we, we can, we can address anything that comes up. Awesome. Dropping that in the chat box sounds great. So uh, Debbie, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm hearing you say what might be some of the implications for a person on the timing of a knee replacement since we are um, spiraling down into a series of compensatory mechanisms that will need to be undone and unlearned. So um, uh, what are some of the implications? You're absolutely right, Debbie. The, the longer we go with dysfunction, the more the whole body has to start to compensate for those dysfunctions. And so what I, I like to try to do as a, as a PT is to try to get some assessment of how much is that dysfunction in the knee, the osteoarthritis in the knee pushed its way up into the hip and down in the foot already, and how quickly are those things deteriorating? And if I'm seeing there's quite a bit of dysfunction already and it's 
causing some poor mechanics around the hip and the foot, then what I like to do is uh, recommend that sooner than later. Um, however, if you know it's just staying at a knee problem, when we can accommodate this at the um, if we can accommodate this at the the bike fit level and give you some exercises and make you feel better, then um, then we can just uh, then we can hang out for a little while longer. So in short, how much is that? How much is that onion grown already? Uh, if it's growing fast and it's growing a lot, then earlier is, is better. Um, if it's growing slow and you want to hold off for a while for whatever reason, that can make sense too. Uh, hopefully that that worked for you, Debbie. Uh, what other questions do we have out there? Uh, we really appreciate this period of time where we can really dig into what makes sense for you and what you're looking for. I'm not Other talking. questions. The, the chat is enabled, so go ahead and, and drop questions okay. in there, um, and uh, and see if, if any, anything comes up. Um, we will be posting this lecture uh, for everybody. Um, those who uh, weren't able to make it back in, uh, we'll be putting that up on our social media channels. And I do believe, as someone asked in the uh, question, is we'll be editing out the, the craziness of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So uh, we appreciate everybody who's here and we like to, to spread the knowledge. So please tell your friends about it. And everybody who's signed up, um, will be getting a link for, for that video. Um, other questions that are, are popping up for any of us. How long does it typically take to correct incorrect movement patterns? Um, thank you, uh, Dana. Um, you know, the, the answer to all questions is it depends. Um, the longer the movement pattern has been there, um, the, the longer it takes. Um, the more people put time and energy into changing it, the less time it takes. Um, and the, uh, the deeper the dysfunction, what I mean by that is, you know, if it's just a, a recent movement pattern that you've picked up, um, uh, you just, you know, sprained your ankle four weeks, six weeks ago, pretty easy to untie. You haven't lost as much strength. You haven't lost as much mobility. On the other hand, if it's um, if it's someone with a, a knee osteoarthritis that's been there for a long time, you know, um, and we're we're trying to move backward on that, we could be three months, six months, or a year even. So, uh, in short, it, it depends. But I'll, I'll say the research uh, suggests that it's thousands of repetitions thousands of repetitions to change a movement pattern and you need to make sure that you're monitoring that. So I usually try to find something that people can do during the day while they're sitting uh, or while they're standing to, to focus on um, by my general experience is give someone a couple of months uh, depending upon the problem and they're usually able to make a significant change in that movement pattern. Um, how long does it tickle? It typically contract. Uh, does optimizing body function for bicycling sometimes makes other things worse for other activities? Um, you want to take that one, uh, Justin? You want me to? Uh, Justin, you are yeah, on mute. No, I'll I'll, uh, I'll start on that. I mean, the in general, what we're we're looking at is trying to make you healthier. Uh, that's kind of the goal here. Is to to, to make you a healthier, more functional human being. And so you can thrive in life, um, being healthier, being more mobile, being stronger, uh, are all things that are going to make life in general better, um, and, and, and make biking better. Um, and so in that sense, we're, we're trying to optimize you in a, in a global sense. It's not, it's not like we're optimizing you to walk around hunched over, like you're in the cycling position all the time. It's, it's more like, you know, recognizing that we sit in front of computers all day and, and our backs are all super bent and, and, and they, we can all do with some degree of, of, of moving better and feeling healthier and stronger. And, and that translates into to better comfort on the bike as well. And Curtis, if you had some more thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree. Um, it's uh, it's almost always that we op when we optimize the body for function, uh, uh, standing better, walking better, uh, uh, even running, we usually optimize the body for cycling at the same time. Because um, cycling, just cycling by itself, if there's no other activities along with it, uh, stretching, hiking, yoga, strength training, when there's no other activities besides cycling, uh, we start to do we lose uh, strength and function in all the other on forward, backward planes of motion. Um, so you, you can certainly say that if you're only cycling and you're only optimizing for cycling in the sense that you're not doing anything else, you can go south. But almost always, if you're really optimizing for cycling, then you're doing other things besides for cycling and that makes the body healthier. 
Um, the question, are the core exercises you described specific for cycling uh, or would they be equally helpful for running? Uh, there was one exercise um, I mentioned in there, the side, the side lying leg lift, which actually I don't think is up on a video. The side lying leg lift, it was one where the band was underneath her knee. You're lying on your side. You're doing a little bit of a, you know, kind of a Jane Fonda leg lift. That one is amazing for running. Um, and then some of the other uh, bent over rowing exercises the hip hinging exercises in some ways can help running, but they are definitely specific uh, to cycling. Um, so a, a mild to a mild amount of benefit uh, for running uh, besides for that one. It's not that it won't help running, but not specific to running. So are the core exercises described uh, specific for cycling or would they be equally good for running? They would not be equally good for running, not bad for running, but not as, as specific. Uh, great question. Dana had wondered what the number one issue we address in terms of the, the, the thing people come in for. And I mean, we definitely see a lot of people that come in injured or hurt or in pain. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, Curtis, what, do you, what, what, would, what would you say the number one thing is you've been at this longer than me? Yeah, pain, um, you know, my knee hurts, uh, my back hurts, I've got numbness in my hands, uh, and my neck hurts. So pain would be number one. Um, number two is I just don't feel efficient on the bike. You know, uh, my wattage has dropped a lot faster than what it should have over the last two to three years. And I feel inefficient. I want more power and more efficiency getting down to the pedal. And I want to know why that is. Um, I'm working hard uh, to be able to get that power up there. I'm sitting on the bike six, eight, 10 hours a week. And what else can I do? Do to improve my efficiency and my economy would be would be my number two besides for um, the regular kind of discomforts that we see and usually honestly when we clear some of the discomforts and the inefficiencies uh, usually performance goes up um, because those inefficiencies and those dragging brakes start to go away and the the core or the the brain starts to control the, the right muscles in the right way at the right time uh, and so pain goes down and function goes up. Yeah, I mean, and just in terms of specific things, like you know, one of the things I see a lot uh, is is uh, th thoracic um, immobility. Um, pe people get really stuck from from sitting looking in their computers, and you just see that again and again and again. As soon as you start yeah. moving forward on the bike, all of a sudden it's just you just reach this point where it just you just stop moving and you're you're all locked up. And um, you know, if I had to pick one thing that I I, I see you know, a lot of benefit from, you see a lot of people getting into some more, uh, that sort of mid back between the shoulders, shoulder mobility too, um, as connected <laughs> issue. But, um. Yeah, that's really well said. And that harkens back to that picture that I had from Thomas Myers of the, the superficial back line, the muscles that were dissected and the comment, um, around it's all connected, uh, and, and the, the, uh, the x-ray picture of someone bending over the bike. So if you bend over the bike in that superficial back line, that string running up your back down to your hamstrings gets rounded. Think about what you're doing to your hamstrings. Think about what you're doing to your, your back, your hips, your diaphragm. Uh, so that mid back uh, stiffness, as you said, Justin, is so rarely um, what people will complain of, though they will complain of pain in their shoulder blades, but it's so often the, um, the unspoken uh, criminal that's working their way down into the, the hips, the knee, the back. So the thoracic spine sometimes yells out, but usually the, the victim is what's yelling out and the criminal is coming up to the low back. So yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the mid back, Justin. It's, it's just really critical. Um, Kristen had asked about whether muscle imbalances or instability in the knees and hips uh, transferring over onto the bike from that might result from, from running uh, or even weightlifting. Um, and, and, and collaterally asking about deadlifts and how they, they translate into cycling. Um, best why running and weightlifting. I'm going to read that question. Can muscle imbalances and instability in the knees and hips transfer to the bike from maybe not the best shoes uh, and form while running and weightlifting? Um, repetitive motion 
repetitive motion and force a la strength training is neuro cement. Uh, in other words, uh, the, it ingr ingrains the movements deep in our body. The um, repetitive motion and weightlifting is kind of like um, creating ruts in your movement system. And so whatever uh, you do a lot of or with a lot of load is going to make the, you, the way you move different even when you hop on the bike, um, whether that's <clears throat> or prolonged motion. So what I'm getting at is, um, yes, is the answer to your question. If you have um, your foot always collapsing while you're running um, because you've got poor, sh not, the, not the right shoes, if you've got bad form while you're running because your hip is always dropping and your, uh, your glute med isn't contracting well, then it's going to make a difference to what happens on the bike. Same body. Now, maybe not exactly the same difference because it's a different way we, we push on the pedal versus the ground. Uh, but yeah, poor form generally starts to show up across multiple spots sports. Um, and, um, and then to the next question, how, how are deadlifts good for cyclists, uh, which I think falls into the same. Um, if you think about what most people are lacking on the bike or what many people are lacking on the bike is when they bend over, they round over as opposed to hinging from their hip. Uh, and so what I mean by that is what you saw in that one picture of me where I'm sitting on the ball and, um, and I was showing an exercise where where you're, you're trying to flex from your hip. And there was also a woman that was doing a row. Um, so most cyclists start to round over. And what I like about deadlifts uh, or a bent over row done well, um, or to some extent for some people, kettlebell swings. What I like about these kind of activities is if you do them well, they train the core in a very efficient way so that the core is keeping your spine relatively neutral. You're not bending over, you're rounding over. Um, uh, you're, not bend, you're not rounding over, you're bending over. So deadlifts can help work on the core stability as opposed to just your crunching ability. Uh, so I'm a big fan of, um, of strength training done well and deadlifts can can nicely fit into that routine. Assuming like with everything, you, you know what good form is and you can see yourself doing good form, especially when you're first stardom. Okay. Uh, anything else? If not, we're, uh, we're at eight 30, which is a bit past. Um, and, and I'll just say it one more. Thank you for, yeah, you're welcome. Um, I got to thank everyone again for especially coming back around um, and hanging in there at 830 on a Thursday night. Um, and it was pretty crazy. Uh, if you have any questions. Um, oh, I forgot to say hang in there for just a second. Uh, if you were on this call, um, you know, on the video, uh, we're doing a we're doing a discount um, for uh, upcoming bike fits uh, and uh, for an upcoming session, actually, which is what I should say uh, discount for an upcoming session. And we'll email that out to you. Um, our bike fits are pretty backed up at the moment uh, but we're doing a discount on an upcoming session we're still working on the what but know that that's out there and um, and tell your friends we really appreciate your referrals and we just love being out here making a difference for people that's what we really love doing thanks everyone for for coming and um, we'll, we'll see you out there on the road uh, keep the rubber side down everyone thanks so much mm -hmm.